Yuval Harari's first book got some heavy-duty endorsements. The other book that I really enjoyed, a book by an Israeli author, Yuval Harari, called Sapiens. Besides Obama, Bill Gates has blogged about it, and Mark Zuckerberg recommended it for his book club. Now, Harari's new book, called Homo Deus, A Brief History of Tomorrow, makes some scary predictions about where we might be headed. How would you know the difference between the dream world and the real world? Harari says the computers aren't in charge yet, but that humans need to be careful. The technology may not always be our friend. So far, the focus has been on improving ourselves, upgrading parts, ultimately, maybe even doubling our lifespan. But Harari warns the risk is humans could be replaced. Authority will shift from the inner feelings of the individuals to the wisdom of these external uh, algorithms. And then there's our obsession with social media. He says oversharing could be dangerous too, as man starts to merge with machines. He warns machines will soon not only be smarter than us, but know us better than we know ourselves. I asked Yuval Harari about what that could mean when I sat down with him in Toronto. Yuval, so nice to meet you. Pleasure to be here. So when I was little, I used to think that by the time I died, I could read everything and understand everything. Um, reading your book, it feels like you sort of have read everything. I'm joking, but what were you looking for? Uh, some answers. Some answers to really big questions about uh, where humankind is heading towards. One of your arguments, interesting arguments, is that we operate on a series of false assumptions that violence and famine and war and even terrorism aren't the things that, that the, not that we've solved that, but that we've kind of moved beyond that. Yes, today in the world, for the first time in history, more people die from eating too much than from eating too little. And more people die from eating too much than from war and crime and terrorism put together. If you look at Canada, uh, the chances of the average Canadian to die from eating too much at McDonald's are about a thousand times bigger than the chances that he or she will be blown up by Al-Qaeda or the Islamic State. And if you look at famine, so today in the world there is no longer natural famine. Famine caused by natural disasters, objective lack of food. There is still people dying for malnutrition and starvation, but it's only for political reasons. You say that the, the latest human quest is immortality and divinity. We're all trying to be superhumans. Is, is that actually happening? Yes. In places like Silicon Valley, uh, equality is out, but immortality is in. Everybody's talking about immortality. Uh, Google has just established two or three years ago a sub-company called Calico, whose stated aim is to solve the problem of death. We've solved search, now we'll solve death. And they are not the only ones. And basically they are saying death is not some metaphysical phenomenon. We don't have to wait for the second coming of Christ in order to solve it. Uh, a couple of geeks in the laboratory can do it. Are they doing it? Yeah, they are investing billions in that. Uh, not only them, but all over the world, basically there are three ways. You can use biological engineering to change the, the, the human body, to speed up natural selection. You can use cyborg engineering, which is combining organic with inorganic parts. And you can create completely inorganic life forms. It will be the, not only the greatest revolution in history, it will be the greatest revolution in biology ever. Will we still be human? not in the sense that we understand humanity today. We are probably one of the last generations of Homo sapiens. In a century or two, uh, either we will destroy ourselves, which I think is less likely, more likely we'll upgrade ourselves into something which is more different from us than we are different from Neanderthals or from chimpanzees. So what's the danger? You say that we could end up merging with computers and we could almost become useless. Humans could be useless. Well, one danger is that, especially as artificial intelligence develops, and it develops at a tremendous pace, within our lifetime, billions of humans will be pushed out of the job market because AI, artificial intelligence, will be better in driving cars, diagnosing disease, even writing articles. And then 
just as the Industrial Revolution in the 19th century created the, work, the urban working class, so in the 21st century will create the useless class. Billions of people who are not just unemployed, but unemployable. And this is a kind of political and social problem that we have never encountered before. So even scarier than the idea of, talk about the 1%, the superhumans and the, the rest of us useless people, <laughs> um, is the idea that we will just become sort of data processors for the system, for the internet of all things. Mm. What's, how does that work? Well, the idea is that once you have enough biometric data about what's happening in your body, well, and we all and wear those, or a lot of people All wear those the wearables apps that collect, yeah, that collect constantly loads of biometric data about your heartbeat, blood pressure, uh, sugar level, everything. And you combine this with enough computing power, you get external algorithms that understand you better than you understand yourself. And increasingly, and we like to share with Google and Facebook all, all of our opinions all, all and secrets. Data, yes. Yes. I mean, the most important asset that most people today still have is their data. And they are giving it for free to Amazon and Google and Facebook in exchange for email services and funny cat videos. But is, are you saying Google and Facebook are gonna take over the world? Not in a you know, Hollywood science fiction style, but decision making will increasingly shift from humans to these algorithms. And just as in the early modern age, authority came down from the clouds, from above the clouds, to humanity. So in the next stage of history, authority will shift back from humans to the clouds, not to the gods, but to the Microsoft cloud, to the Google cloud. They'll just understand us so well that it will be crazy not to listen to their advice about what book to read, whom to marry, where to work, and what to vote in the elections. And the other key question is who owns the data? I mean, today, the most important asset in the world is not oil and it's not gold, it's data. And especially personal data and biometric data. And the question of who owns it is one of the most important political questions we have today. Who owns the data about humankind? And it's quite frightening that at present, more and more of this data is being owned by a very small number of corporation and people. Can they stop it? Can they control it? Can humans still control this? You can't stop it. You can't say, okay, we are now stopping all research in biotechnology. It's not going to happen. But you still have some agency, some influence about the direction it is going. But can't we control that? Isn't what makes us superior to computers that we have a consciousness, that we have feelings? Hmm. And computers don't have that. That's, the internet doesn't have that. That's definitely true. Even though we are developing artificial intelligence, we are definitely not developing artificial consciousness. In science fiction movies, AI usually develops consciousness. It suddenly has feelings, it has emotions, it has desires. This is not happening. Over the last 60, 70 years, there has been immense development in computer intelligence, there has been exactly zero development in computer consciousness. So then aren't we safe because that's what makes us special? <laughs> it makes us special, but the problem is that from an economic and military perspective, consciousness isn't important. What the system needs is intelligence. In human beings, intelligence and consciousness go together. You cannot separate them. But what we see now is a decoupling of intelligence from consciousness and from an economic perspective, for instance, if you think about taxi driver. So what the system needs from a taxi driver is basically intelligence to solve problems on the road. If you can get that without feelings, without consciousness, then you'll sack all the taxi drivers, they'll be left without a job, and you'll just employ AI, artificial intelligence. The fact that the computer has no feelings of, it, of its own um, doesn't really matter because you don't really need the feelings of the taxi driver. You just need a taxi to bring you from point A to point B as cheaply and efficiently and safely as possible. We, uh, we think we're morally superior to animals. Mm -hmm. You argue that we should think more about how we treat the chickens in cages, for example. Why? Because there are basically two, two arguments that people use to justify the horrendous way 
in which we treat animals in the meat and dairy and egg industry. One argument is that they don't feel anything. Emotions and feelings are not unique to Homo sapiens. They are common. All mammals, all birds, and probably at least some reptiles and fish have emotions, have feelings, they can suffer. The second argument why we shouldn't care about the emotions of animals is that we are far more intelligent. And intelligence counts for more than feelings and emotions. The danger here is that very soon we'll have on Earth entities which are more intelligent than we are. So if you think that an intelligent entity can treat uh, conscious beings um, in such a way because they're less intelligent, this is very dangerous for humans in the 21st century because this is how we'll be treated by these super intelligent entities that we are now creating. So we will become a lower life form? In terms of intelligence, yes. Huh. It is quite likely that in, I don't know, 50 years, 100 years, Homo sapiens will no longer be the most intelligent being around. There'll be something more intelligent than us on Earth. Should we panic? I think we should. I think it's a very big danger that is facing billions of people today. I mean, people, kids who go to school today, nobody really knows if most of them will have any kind of job when they are 30 or 40. Uh, even if they have jobs, nobody knows what to teach them today, so they will still be relevant in 2050. It's a question we need to address today. Kind of mind-blowing. Thank uh, you. Yeah. Thanks. So interesting. Yeah, it is.